Welcome to the congregation of Yahweh. We're here on Yahweh's Sabbath day. Greetings to those on the internet or those that might be watching live. Uh, today's message is concerning uh, how to understand the new covenant. And um, <clears throat> a lot of people, when you discuss anything prior to the book of Matthew, they'll say, oh, well, that's the old covenant. I, I'm, I live in the new covenant. And in their mind, what they're saying is, I live according to Matthew to Revelations. What you're talking about, that's something old and that's, that's different. That's, I'm new, that's old. But Matthew to Revelations is not the New Covenant. That's a traditional term placed on a compilation of books. There's only one verse in all of Scripture that actually says, new covenant and it's quoted twice in the book of Hebrews Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 9 uh, so technically there's, there's three verses that talk about it, the new covenant but the origin of that verse is Jeremiah chapter 31 and there's only a few other references in scripture that give us a glimpse as to what the new covenant is so and um you guys pray for me. I'm taking this message to North Georgia next weekend. And uh, there's going to be some, some visitors there that I, that I think need to hear this. And, um, but anyway, so we're going to go to the New Testament or Messianic Scriptures first and glean some things from there. And we're going to come up to a conclusion of uh, our position our relationship towards what they call old in Galatians chapter 3 and I got a lot of information here so bear with me I'm gonna be moving as usual <laughs> Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 Messiah hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us this does not say he has redeemed us from the law that is a curse it says he's redeemed us from the curse that comes from disobedience to the law, which is death. He's redeemed us from death. Just how easy it is for people to twist those scriptures. They see that and they, oh, the law was a curse. He delivered us from that. But no, he delivered us from the penalty. He took the penalty upon himself. And if the law doesn't apply to you, why did he take the curse for you? Verse 14, why did he do that? Why did he take that curse? That the blessing of Abraham might come on the nations, the Gentiles, through Yeshua the Messiah. What is the blessing of Abraham? We're going to revisit that. Galatians chapter 3 verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into the Messiah have put on Messiah. That means to be clothed with him. Your identity is gone. That old nature is gone. You have been clothed with the Messiah. That's your new nature. My question is, is Messiah being disobedient through you? Or is he obeying through you? I submit that if you're transgressing his instructions, Messiah can't be in you. So if we're to bear his image, it needs to be an obedient image, not a disobedient image. That's the false Messiah. That's a different Savior. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. It doesn't mean these identities don't exist. It means that Yahweh is not a respecter of persons. It means that he doesn't see skin tone, he doesn't see bloodline, he does not see culture. We're all on the same playing field. He does not show favoritism. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 29. And if you be the Messiah, if you're truly his, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs of that blessing that was given to Abraham. John chapter 8. The Messiah is having a little debate with the religious leaders of the day, he identifies who Abraham's children are. 
So Paul tells us in Galatians, if we're truly in Messiah, we're Abraham's seed. And in John chapter 8, verse 39, Yeshua speaking to the religious leaders says, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Yeshua saith unto him, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So combining these two verses, if we're truly in the Messiah, we should do the works of Abraham. We're going to revisit that. A lot of people say, well, I'm a Gentile. I'm a, I'm a new covenant Gentile. That's old covenant Jewish stuff. Are you really a Gentile in the Messiah? Let's find out. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2 says, You know that you were Gentiles, carried away by these dumb idols even as you were led. Past tense, you used to be Gentiles when you were carried away by dumb idols. It says were. Past tense. Ephesians chapter 2. Starting in verse 11. Wherefore, remember that you being in times past Gentiles. That means you used to be a Gentile in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision. That means the Jews call you uncircumcised. Verse 12, that at that time, what time? When you were a Gentile. At that time, when you were a Gentile, you were without the Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise and have no hope, and you were without Yahweh in the world. So I ask you again, do you want to be a Gentile? Do you want to be without the Messiah? Do you want to be an alien from the citizenship of Israel? Do you want to be a stranger from the covenants of promise and having no hope and without Yahweh in the world? I don't want to be a Gentile. And now, but now, in Messiah Yeshua, you who were sometimes far off, far off was a, uh, a quote in many places in the traditionally called Old Testament, far off meant away from the covenant people. Far off meant those not of Israel. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who sometimes were far off have been made near by the blood of Messiah. For he is our peace who hath made both one. Both. What does both mean? Both groups of people. Both Israel and those far off of the nations have been brought together into one. He hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself the twain one new man, so making peace. Meaning he took two groups of people and made them one. And unfortunately, there's some people out there that, here that, uh, not here, people out there that interpret this as, oh, that was the law of Moses. He abolished in his flesh the law of Moses. Um, Moses didn't have any law for one. He only wrote what Yahweh told him to. It was traditionally called Moses' uh, the law of Moses because he wrote it. But it wasn't his. It came from somewhere else. So what commandments contained in ordinances separated Israel from the nations? You won't find it in Yahweh's instructions. They were actually, uh, the stranger could come in and be one with Israel. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to be a light to the nations. The nations were supposed to um, admire the wisdom of the instructions that they lived by. No, uh, these commandments that separated the Jew from the Gentile, we found that we find that broken down in Acts chapter 10 when Peter receives the vision of the unclean beasts. And a voice tells him, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, Uh-uh, I'm not doing it. Three times he said, No, I'm not doing it. And while he doubted what that vision might mean, three unclean men were coming to him. And see, I believe that he was building Peter up to this great mission. 
uh, Peter rejected Yeshua three times. Three times he said, do you love me? Three times, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Three times he has this vision. And while he's doubting as to what the interpretation might mean, three men come to see him. Three men that traditionally he's not even supposed to fellowship with. And the Spirit says, go with these men and don't doubt. So he goes to the men. He comes to Cornelius. And um, they were told that uh, Peter had the words of salvation. And he says in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, you know that it is unlawful for me being a Jew to come in and associate with you people. But Yahweh has showed me that I should call no man unclean. That vision, that vision was to tell Peter, take this message well, it was to confirm with Peter what he'd already told him after the resurrection. He said, take this message to every creature, to uh, uh, every creature, every nation, every tongue, every kindred. But what did Peter say? I'm going fishing. <laughs> and that's why he had to ask Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these fish here? Okay. Um, so that's what was broken down. That was what was separating Israel from the nations and um, there's a, a bigger mystery going on here as to why the Gentiles are are coming into the to the faith and that's a whole nother story which we've gotten into that uh, before but that was a mystery um, verse uh, chapter 2 and verse uh, 16 so in verse 15, it says that he abolished in his flesh the commandments containing ordinances for to make of the two, two groups, into one, so making peace. Verse 16, and that he might reconcile both, both groups, unto Yahweh in one body by the stake or the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And this is one point, ladies and gentlemen, that we need to keep in mind. He goes into great detail to tell us how we've all been brought into one body. Oh, we're going to read some more verses, but over and over through the Messianic scriptures, it's one body, whether of the nations, whether of the believing Jews, the house of Israel as a whole, we are one body. We've been granted into one body. So the question is, if we're one body and Israel was told how to live forever, and teach it to their children and their children's children forever. How is that one body supposed to be living? But today they're teaching, we're the church and they're Israel. And uh, we're under this new grace thing. They were under that old law thing. Well, if we're one body with one way of life under one shepherd, then... If we're not living the way the covenant people were told to live, we have a problem. There's a disconnect. In uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Yeshua Messiah, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of Yahweh, which was given me towards you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Messiah, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, he's about to reveal to us a great mystery that a lot of people throughout the ages did not know, and it was made manifest in these last days. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Messiah by the Gospels. That was the mystery. That's probably why Peter didn't know to just go out there and take it to every creature, because he had been taught not to fellowship with these people. It was unlawful by their own traditions. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, 
and have been all made to drink into one spirit. And what we just read earlier, by one spirit, we both have access to the Father. All nations, anybody, can come to the Father through one spirit, and that makes us one body. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 to whom Yahweh would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery amongst the nations, the Gentiles, which is Messiah in you, the hope of glory. This mystery, another part of this mystery, is to have Messiah in you. And if Messiah is in you, is he being obedient? Or is he being disobedient? Here's a few more verses that would lead us to believe that we do not need to be identified amongst the Gentiles. And I'm just going to read through them because it's only one verse in several different books. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as not so much as names amongst the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. This is the things that the Gentiles do. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the master that you henceforth walk not as Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 5. Not in the lust of concupiscence even as the Gentiles which know not Yahweh. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 3. For in times past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walk in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquets, and abominable idolatries. This is what the Gentiles do. So, where do the Gentiles, where do the nations come in? Let's go to Romans chapter 11. And this is Paul is about to go into great detail to explain how the nations, the Gentiles, have come into the faith. And if we have time, I'll do a little, a little preview after this. Uh, it's a pretty in-depth study, but I'll try to compact it into a digestible form after we uh, cover this chapter. Romans chapter 11, 11, verse 1. I say then, hath Yahweh cast away his people? Yah forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul is using himself as a, an example that Israel has not been cast away. But you know why Paul is an example? Because he believed. Verse 5 Skipping on for the sake of time. Verse 5 says, Even so then at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Paul was part of that remnant. Why? Because he believed. Romans chapter 11 verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeks for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Part of Israel were not part of the election. Why? Let's go back to Romans chapter 9. It's going to tell us why. Romans chapter 9 and verse 30. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? And how are the Gentiles called? By grace. The Gentiles did not come into this house. They didn't stumble into it. They were called. And they were called by grace. It was part of a huge, huge plan that we can't put on paper in one city. <laughs> but, uh... Verse 31, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Yeshua the Messiah was the stumbling stone. That they stumbled on. Continuing on as to why they weren't not, not all of them were part of the elect. Romans chapter 10 verse 3. 
For they, being ignorant of Yahweh's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of Yahweh. For Messiah is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Some try to make sense out of that verse as, well, Messiah is the goal. The mainstream says, oh, he's the end of the law. But what it actually says in uh, 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 to for clarity, he is the end of achieving your own righteousness through the law. After he came, he put a stop to that. You can only get your righteousness through faith in him. You cannot do it by your own works. He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Verse 5, so we, being many... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's back it up to, uh, let's continue in uh, chapter 11. Verse, verse 11. Little recap on verse 7. Uh, it says, What then Israel hath not obtained that which it seeks for, but the election hath obtained it. Those that didn't obtain it is because they were trying to do it by their own works. Establish their own righteousness through their own works which came with a myriad of tradition and um, uh, commentary upon commentary and, you know. Verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Yah forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. I have, a, I have a question based off of this verse. The faith that you're walking in, will it make blind Israel jealous? I promise you this. The Israelites that know their scriptures will in no way, shape, or form be driven to jealousy by the mainstream church. They pray to three gods. They eat the unclean. They do away with all the things that were called holy and righteous and good. How's that going to make an Israelite jealous? Never. Their religion is an abomination to somebody that knows the true scriptures. So Paul, uh, Paul is uh, saying that through their fall is salvation come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. I submit that when the nations come in to Israel, keep the feasts of Israel, keep the dietary instructions of Israel, and are blessed from the Most High of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that would make them jealous. When they come in and partake of the scriptures that Israel was supposed to live by and they're blessed for it, that would make them jealous. For Verse 13, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation or jealousy of them which are of my flesh and might save some of them. For if the, if the casting away of them be the reconciliation of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Um, they were, he's going to get into the tree illustration, but if they're broken off of the tree so that the nations can be grafted into the tree, how much more when, when they come back to the tree will it be life from the dead? And I, I think that's uh, possibly talking about two things here. When they return to the tree, that is going to be life from the dead. But also when blind Israel returns back to the tree, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead because their king will be coming and their blindness will be removed. We'll get to that here in just a minute. Um, Verse uh, 16, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, 
And you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in amongst them, and with them partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if you boast, you bear not the root, but the root you. Meaning, these branches were broken off of the tree. This tree is Israel, by the way. They were broken off of the tree because they rejected their Messiah and they did not have faith. This is unbelieving Israel. He's saying when you come into this tree, don't boast against them. That's part of a plan you might not understand. And uh, they're still beloved for the Father's sake and he still has a plan for them. And as we go on, he's going to say that they're enemies of the gospel, but they're loved for the Father's sake. And he still has a, a plan. We'll get into that a little more in a minute. Uh, verse 19, you will say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and you stand by faith. Be not high minded, but fear. For if Yahweh spared not the natural branches, take heed lest also he spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of Yahweh on them which fell severity. Them being broken off of their own tree was a manifestation of his severity. But towards thee, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise Thou also shall be cut off. Uh, that's a very good verse to go along with. Once saved, always saved. Anyway, verse 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for Yahweh is able to graft them in again. He can put them back on the tree if they continue not in unbelief. And there are many coming to the faith today, but when that king comes... In the clouds, and they receive him, when they receive him the way they were looking for him the first time, they're going to believe. Verse 24, For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own tree? Verse 25, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. What I'm about to say is a great mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part is happened to Israel. Part of Israel has been made blind. Until, that means they're blind for a season. Until the fullness of the nations become in, the fullness of the Gentiles. That's part of that mystery that we might touch on here in a few minutes. But when the fullness of the nations become in, the king will return. Their blindness will be removed. They're blind until the nations come in, and then their king will return. Um, and so all Israel shall be saved. Who's all Israel? The branches that stayed on the tree, the branches that were grafted to the tree, and the branches that returned to the tree through faith. For this, all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away un ungodliness from Jacob. This deliverer that returns to Zion is the one that's going to return when the fullness of the nations be come in. For this is my covenant unto them which I shall take away their sins, their blindness. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Um, a couple more verses on us being one body. We just discussed us being one tree. Uh, there's numerous prophecies about Israel and Judah coming back together into one, under one shepherd, under one king, with one way of life. So when we're reading the Messianic Scriptures and we understand that we're one body, we've got to go back and find out how Israel was told to live forever. And that is our relationship uh, to his instructions. But uh, first, Romans uh, chapter 12 and verse 5 says, So we, being many, are one body in Messiah and every one members of another. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 says, 
For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Messiah. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether we're Jews or Gentiles, whether bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. I've read that already. Verse 14, for the body is not one member, but many. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 says, there is one body and one spirit. It can't get any plainer. So if Israel was told to live a certain way forever, and we're one body with them, obviously we should be doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, uh, I'm going to scroll through a little history here. In Genesis chapter 15, the promise that we talked about was given to Abraham. And Abraham says, well, I don't have any kids. And uh, verse 5 of, of Genesis chapter 15, it says, he, he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards the heavens and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed Yahweh, and he counted it to him for righteousness, because Yahweh believed it was accredited to him as being righteous. That was ingredient number one. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 16, right, uh, previously this time, Yahweh said, I want you to sacrifice your only son. And Abraham did exactly what he was told to do until he said, stop. Don't lay your hand on the lad. Verse 16, he says, uh, by myself have I sworn, said Yahweh, for because you have done this thing. And hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thee as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations, that means all the Gentiles of the earth, be blessed, because thou hast obeyed. My voice, ingredient number two. James tells us that our works perfect our faith. And without your works, your faith is worthless. This same promise was passed down from Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. In verse chapter 26, verse 3, talking to Isaac, he says, Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Wait a minute. This is Genesis chapter 26. This is a whole other book before Mount Sinai. You mean there was laws and commandments and statutes before Mount Sinai? According to the scriptures, that's the works of Abraham. Through faith, he was obedient. That's the works of Abraham. In uh, Genesis chapter 28, the same promise is given to uh, Jacob. He says um, in verse 14, your seed shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, the east, the north, and the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Um, so a little preview from here. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob marries Rachel and Leah. And through two concubines, they have the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph is sold into slavery by his jealous brothers which was for a uh, good reason to preserve the house of Israel. Uh, Joseph is raised to power, becomes a ruler in Egypt. And while he is in Egypt, he has Ephraim and Manasseh. Uh, Ephraim and Manasseh actually become two tribes. So there's actually 13 tribes in Israel. And then after, um, after Joseph dies... Uh, we start in Exodus chapter 1. Uh, the families of Israel came into Egypt and they became numerous. 
so numerous that it feared, the Egyptians feared them, and they said, let's make them taskmasters and rule over them before they come, become too numerous and overtake us and join our enemies. So they started killing or commanding the midwives to kill the male children. This is when Moses is sent off into a basket. Another, you know, it's, isn't it interesting how Yahweh sends somebody before his people to be a deliverer? And all these things uh, can be considered foreshadows of our Messiah. The blessing, because of Abraham's obedience, the blessing comes upon all. Because of the obedience of Yeshua, the blessing of eternal life and righteousness can come upon all. And here he sends Moses before his people to preserve them. So um, Moses actually is raised in Egypt. He ends up killing an Egyptian uh, Pharaoh finds out about it. He flees into Midian, Midian, and then Yahweh says, I want you to go back and tell them to let my people go. And Moses says, who am I that I should do that? And he said, just go. <laughs> so uh, in Exodus chapter 3, there's a, a burning bush. He reveals his name to Moses. And then uh, so uh, you have the Exodus story. You have plagues and uh, uh, wonders. Um, he brings them out with... Um, a mighty and, and strong hand he says so let's pick up they're departing from that was the quick preview by the way they're departing from Egypt and uh, the Passover is going to be instituted on on the day that, that they depart in Exodus chapter 12 now what I'm trying to do I'm gonna I'm gonna skip I took some notes and skim through some verses that talk about how Israel is supposed to live and how long that's supposed to last Exodus chapter 12 and verse 14 says, And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. You shall keep it a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So as long as Israel exists, they're supposed to be keeping the Passover as a memorial forever. Now we're back to the one body thing. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 17 concerning unleavened bread, for in this selfsame day I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. Uh, chapter 12 verse 43. This is an ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. So if you keep the Passover, you've got to be one with Israel. Verse 48. When the stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to Yahweh, let all his males be circumcised and then let him... Come near and keep it, and he shall be as one born in the land. If a stranger becomes circumcised and is obedient, he will be as one native born, like he was born there. Sounds like grafting in to me. Kind of like, you know, we have a law here. If you're born in America, you're American. No matter where you come from, doesn't matter what country you came from, if you're born here, you're American. And with Israel... If you obey the mighty one of Israel, you're as one born in the land. No circumcised person shall eat thereof. Verse 49. One law shall be to him that is home born and unto the stranger that sojourns with you. That tosses out the notion that Israel has law and Gentile got something else. Um, Exodus chapter 13. Concerning Passover and unleavened bread, again, it says, uh, verse 10, You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. Uh, Exodus chapter 16, concerning the Sabbath. Now here, I'm just going to preview this. Uh, <clears throat> he's, he's, he says that I'm going to test you with this manna to see if you're going to obey my commandments and my laws. He told him to collect the manna. For six days and on the seventh day there wasn't going to be any and when that when they went out looking for the manna he says how long are you going to disobey my commandments and my laws wait a minute this is before mount sinai the sabbath was before mount sinai he was just trying to reveal it uh, to them as a matter of fact there's a verse in nehemiah i think it's chapter 15 it says that he revealed unto israel his sabbath Reveal means something that's already there. He just revealed it. Why did he have to reveal his Sabbath and his laws to Israel? Because they had been in slavery for 430 years. They were ignorant of his law. 
Um, so in uh, Exodus chapter 19, <clears throat> in verse 3, And Moses went up to Yahweh, to El, and Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which Yahweh commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh hath spoken we will do. Ladies and gentlemen, they just entered into a covenant. This is after the Sabbath, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, after those things were taught and before Mount Sinai. But he says, if you do this, then I will do this. And they entered into a covenant. And then after they entered into this agreement, he re revealed the rest of his instructions on how they want to live. But the covenant, the agreement is right here found in these few verses. If you obey me, then I will be your L. Uh, Exodus chapter 31, verse 2. 13, speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, Yahweh, does sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. And whosoever does any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from amongst his people. Six days may work be done, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy unto Yahweh. Whosoever does any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. I don't see how it can get any plainer than that. If Israel exists, they're supposed to be keeping the Sabbath, and that's a sign that he sanctifies them. Verse 17, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Why does he take it back to creation? Because that's when he made it holy. Genesis chapter 2, the very beginning, he made it a holy day long before Israel existed. The Sabbath was a holy day, and it was blessed. Uh, I'm not going to discuss it, but Exodus chapter 32, we got the golden calf incident. And it's interesting that they come out of one bondage and get right back into another. And a lot of people come to faith in a Savior and run right back into idolatry. Or they're raised in it. So Moses is up on the mountain getting the tables of stone. And it says that Yahweh did the tables of stone. Gives them to Moses. Then they hear dancing and singing going down in the, uh, the camp. Moses comes down and breaks the tables of stone. And I believe, and this, the tables of stone is done twice. I believe this is allegorical to the two covenants. The first tables of stone were broken because of idolatry. And um, this time, after Moses goes back up, he says, you carve out your own stone, and I will write the same law upon the stone that you cut out. And I think that's representative of man's stony heart he has to present to Yahweh. And Yahweh writes his laws on that stony heart, and he gives him a fleshly heart. Um, Exodus chapter 19 talks about the diet, separating the clean from the unclean. He says these things are an abomination. Unclean in the Hebrew means foul and defiled and polluted. Clean means pure. Pure. Both ceremonially, morally, and ethically. Pure. Abomination means detestable, unclean, 
disgusting, or even an idol. In verse 45 of chapter 11, it says, For I am Yahweh that brings you out of the land of Egypt to be your Elohim. You shall be holy, for I am holy. Who quoted that in the Messianic Scriptures? Peter. He said, You will be holy, for as it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. It came from the dietary chapter. This is the law of the beasts, of the fowl, and every living creature that moves in the waters, and every creature that creeps upon the earth, to make a difference between the unclean and the clean, between the beast that may be eaten and the beasts that may not be eaten. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to scroll through. Uh, for the rest of all the feast days that he discussed, you've got atonement in Leviticus chapter 16. You've got the rest of the feast in Leviticus chapter 23. Every single one of them says these are to be done forever. Every one of them. So as long as Israel is a nation, they should be keeping these things. So uh, a lot of people, they, they understand that there is a relationship between the Torah and the Old Covenant. And it's obvious through the Messianic Scriptures that the Torah is, is not done away with. So it's hard to reconcile some of those verses where it says like the old is, is being done away and, and the new is drawing near. Or, you know, anyway. But or, And some say it's just a renewal of that which was old. But I have a problem with that. Namely because in Jeremiah chapter 31... It says, not according to the covenant that I made with them when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. And, and recently, we just did a study a couple weeks ago, the word according is not there. It actually says, not the covenant that I made when I brought them out of Egypt. It's not that covenant. Why? Because the first covenant, you had to do this before I would do this. It was based off of their actions, their works, which I believe that's the reason there's a veil upon their hearts when they read the Old Covenant because they're still seeing the works. All right? The New Covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31 is simply I. I will do this. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. It doesn't say they got to do something first before I do this. It just says I am going to do this. And how did he do it? He sent his son to touch our hearts and give us of his spirit. And he writes his law on our hearts. And we want to obey him out of love. And his commandments are not grievous. Hallelujah.